Premenstrual dysphoric disorder, or PMDD, is a life debilitating condition that I lived with for over 25 years. It stopped me from creating the life that I truly desired and deserved until I was finally diagnosed and given a total hysterectomy at the age of 40. By talking about my journey, Many other women have had light bulb moments and have recognised this condition in themselves or in a friend or loved one and have then gone on to reclaim their lives. It is thought that 5% of menstruating women suffer from PMDD. However, I believe that percentage to be much higher. I was eight years old when I had my first period. I know, how young. My twin girls are now 10 and I can't imagine having to deal with that at such a young age. When I was 13 years old, I was put on the contraceptive pill because my mood swings were so dramatic. The highs were highs and the lows were low. And I remember feeling rage that I just couldn't control. I didn't know it at the time, but something was starting in me that was connected to my hormones. Throughout my teenage and adult life, those mood swings got worse. I was put on different contraceptive pills by various doctors and I gained a lot of weight. I remember seeing a dietitian when I was younger and I was told to eat a chunk of bread if I was hungry to fill me up. I can't help but think that it was the contraceptive pill that added to me gaining so much weight. As if being a teenager wasn't difficult enough, I had massive boobs to contend with. When my period was due, I would get myself into a complete state and I wouldn't know how to control it. I suffered from really bad cramps and the moods would be dark and I couldn't escape them. Even at a young age, though I thought it was just normal and that everybody else went through the same thing at the time of month. A few years into secondary school, I was bullied quite badly. Some of my friends at school were older than me and I would talk to my brother's friends who were a few years above me and some people just did not like that. They would shout at me across the street, slag, slut, fat bitch. They even did it in front of my mum, which showed that they just didn't care what they were doing. I didn't have much self-confidence and I think I overcompensated by being loud and cocky. I was a bit of a tomboy too. A lot of my friends were boys. I seemed to connect better with them than girls. I hated going to school. I had long, thick ginger hair, freckles, fixed braces on my teeth and I wore glasses. None of these things did anything for my self-esteem, but that was only a small part of it. The monthly battle with my mind that I was going through was something else. I believed that everybody hated me. Why would anybody want to be my friend? In my late teens, I had a boyfriend who lived in London. I would travel to his, he would travel to my house in Hertfordshire at the weekends, and I would often stay with him in London. He was 22 and I was 16 when we met. Most of my friends were older than me, so having an older boyfriend just felt natural. He was an East End lad that had a heart of gold and he completely adored me. I loved having him in my life because I could escape to London with him and his friends and family and I could be me. We had a bit of a turbulent relationship and I, we would often argue. I would get so emotional, stressed and angry. I thought this was normal in relationships. I couldn't see any connection to my menstrual cycle at all. I remember when we would argue that I would be filled with such rage, I just couldn't control my feelings. I would scream and cry hysterically and want to end our relationship. Then the next minute I would love and adore him and never wanted to let him go. I hated living inside my own head. Tragically, he died when he was 24 and I was just 18. He died in front of my eyes of a massive brain hemorrhage. It completely destroyed me. I would say that it took seven years to get over the grief of losing him. I completely sabotaged myself. After a year of not leaving the house, I drank, smoked, took drugs, 
parted hard, got into a few really bad relationships with very controlling people. And I tried committing suicide on a number of occasions. I was crying out for help. The grief was killing me. But every month, this mood that came over me got darker and darker. I felt like I was going mad and I couldn't escape. I had a very good friend who could see the turmoil that I was in. And I remember him taking me to a bookshop to buy a book about PMT. He could see what was happening to me and that it was a part of my cycle. Just as I was coming out of the grief of losing Stephen at the age of 25, my dad died very suddenly of a massive brain hemorrhage. He was only 53. History had just repeated itself. How the fuck was I going to deal with this? I was so numb, but I was stronger this time because I knew what to expect. I know that's a weird thing to say, but grief had become a part of my life. My dad and I had a turbulent relationship too. He'd been a heavy drinker on and off, but for everything that he put me through, I adored him. I was a daddy's girl, but we had a real love-hate relationship. We were two alike, I think. My drinking and behaviour mirrored his, and he couldn't cope with my moods, so we clashed a lot of the time. After hitting rock bottom, I sought help for the drugs and the drinking, and I got myself back together. It was then that I discovered self-help. A psychiatrist once said to me that I couldn't change my dad and his actions, but I could change my reactions and mindset towards him. That was a massive light bulb moment for me. Maybe I could change the way I felt and thought about things. Something inside of me made that very difficult to do. A year after my dad passed away, I travelled the world alone, which was an incredible experience. When I came home, I kept climbing the career ladder and life was good. I had a few lovely boyfriends, but I would sabotage every relationship. I would push them all away until they ended the relationship with me. As much as it hurt, it was like me saying to myself, you see, you were right, no one can love you. You're not worth it. There was a constant turmoil in my head. My mum had the patience of a saint with me. I remember once asking her to make me a bacon sandwich and I specifically asked for her for the fat to be crispy. I went downstairs, she lovingly gave me the sandwich but it wasn't cooked exactly how I wanted it. So I threw the plate with the sandwich at the back door in complete rage and frustration, not at my mum, although she obviously thought it was, but it just tipped me over the edge. I remember her saying really calmly, I'm just going to leave the house for a while. And she walked out the door. I don't blame her one little bit. It must have been so hard living with me. I'm sure she could write her own book about it. I moved out of our family home when I was 22. My parents helped me buy my first flat and I loved my independence. I had a great job and a sports car and I was living the dream on the outside. I was fiercely independent and on reflection of that, I think it's because I would push people away from me. It was a coping me mechanism that I had developed during my dark weeks. During these weeks, I was intolerant to noise touch, light. I would be confused and clumsy. I would find it hard to string a sentence together. I had extreme fatigue, but sleep became my superpower. Not only because I was exhausted, but also because the longer I slept, the less of life I would have to deal with. I couldn't cope with leaving the house or doing the washing, for example. Simple tasks were so difficult. I would feel paranoid like no one liked me and I believed that people were always talking about me and that's why I never formed strong group relationships. I had very few select friends who I can say are still amazing friends to me now. They knew and loved me for the real me and they still do thankfully. If you said hello to me in the wrong way I would feel like you hated me. I had constant chatter in my head, self-hatred and utter rage about anything and everything. 
Most months I would have suicidal thoughts. The chatter inside my head would say, I just wish I was dead. I would drive along the road wishing that a lorry would plough into me and take my life so that I could escape myself. It was such a strong and uncontrollable feeling. I could never plan anything because I would never know how I would be feeling when the time came. So it was easier not to. The thought of somebody saying to me, let's book a holiday for next year or even in six months time would fill me with dread. I would be able to feel the mood start. It was like someone flicking a switch and I would die a little inside every time because I knew what was coming and that I couldn't control it. It sounds crazy, I know, but I genuinely had no control over it. I would start to sink and feel As soon as my body would ovulate, so halfway through my cycle, I would start to sink and dark feelings would come over me. It would get deeper and deeper and my brain became taken over with the darkest of thoughts. My throat would start to close and feel tight. I could feel it physically as well as emotionally. My body would literally feel from my toes to my head with a heavy, angry feeling. Deep depression would come along with anger and rage. If things in life were generally good, then the effects were lighter, but they were still there. If I was in a bad place in a relationship or having a stressful time, for example, the deeper I would go. The weird thing is that I knew what was happening, but I was trapped inside my own head and there was no way of escaping it. I would start an argument for no reason and I would say to myself in my head, what are you doing? Just stop. You are completely overreacting. You are being irrational, but nothing I said or did could stop it. I would start arguments in restaurants if something went wrong. I wouldn't let it go. I had to keep fighting. It felt almost like a release, like when someone who self-harms cuts their skin. I would get road rage. Once someone cut me up on a particularly tricky roundabout and I totally lost my ship. I actually chased the woman down the road, flashing my lights for her to pull over. Amazingly, she did, and I got out of the car. I stood at her driver's door and shouted at her that I had my babies in the back of the car and that she nearly crashed into me and what a terrible person she was for putting me and my children in such danger. Despite the fact I had now left my children in the car on the side of the road with the door wide open whilst I was raging at this poor woman. All wife all whilst screaming at myself in my head, what the fuck are you doing? Just stop. But I just couldn't stop. When things like this happened, they would continue to consume me for days. I'd carry on raging about whatever it was that had happened. Can you imagine just how exhausting that was? One big thing that would happen was that I would always want to end my relationships. With the flick of a switch, I would look at my partner and hatred would come over me. A deep feeling that I never wanted to see that person again. Whatever they did or said would annoy me so much that I would feel the need to end the relationship. I wouldn't get irritated or a little bit upset about things. I would convince myself that it was over, how I could cope without them, what my life would look like. I would picture myself being happy and single. I hated them deep deep hatred. I would look at that person and say the most awful things in my head to convince myself that they were no good. I never actually let anyone get that close to me. I would battle with myself in my own head constantly that they were no good. They didn't love me and I was better off without them. I have never been afraid of being on my own and that probably didn't help the cause. I was happy being single but I needed to be in a relationship. I was constantly contradicting myself. Most of my relationships lasted for two years and looking back now, I've worked out why. We all love that feeling of falling in love and being in that happy, fuzzy place, right? Because when things in life are good, my feelings were okay to live with. So by meeting someone new, it seemed to keep my bad feelings at bay. But as time went on, we slipped into that long-term relationship mode and things got a little boring, the mood swings got worse. 
They would get so bad that I would sabotage the relationship. My mood would escalate month after month. And then it would end generally in the autumn when my sad syndrome kicked in. Another great symptom of what I was going through. My mum told me that she and my brother would say, well, he survived it through November. She must like him. I would be happy again, start a new relationship and the two year cycle would repeat itself. It's so clear to me now as I write this. At the time, I had absolutely no idea why I would react to things in the extreme way that I did. Interestingly, when I met my, the father of my children, things were great. I was in that new relationship mode. I fell pregnant with twins when we had only been together for four months and all of my symptoms stopped because I wasn't having a cycle. Their poor dad. Can you imagine the shock that came after I'd had our twin girls and my cycles had started again, mixed with pregnancy hormones, no sleep and newborn twins. The feelings all came back with a vengeance and our relationship started to break. Something simple would annoy me, but in my dark weeks, it was the end of the world. My life was made so difficult by this fucking horrible condition. If only I knew what it was, I could have controlled it. We had another baby when our girls were just 22 months old and again the bad feelings had subsided during my second pregnancy but the cracks were already there. We attended couples counselling through my second pregnancy and we tried to make things work. It didn't work and we didn't want to stay together for the sake of the children. We decided with good grace to end our relationship so that we didn't end up destroying each other and living a life of struggle. It took a long time, but we, but we both worked really hard at our relationship. And I can honestly say that we are now very good friends and we enjoy bringing up our children together, but apart. One thing that the counselling taught us was how to communicate effectively with each other. Along with the counselling, I had some CBT and that really did help me. Although it was my CBT therapist who told me I had a form of bipolar and that I would be happier if I was single. My children's father would call my moods my black moods. I would completely shut down and go silent for days, even weeks. I guess that was me going into freeze, fight or flight mode. If I could no longer carry on fighting, I would shut down. It was the only way I knew how to cope. During that time, I would be having the battle in my head Stop being so irrational. What the fuck are you doing? Just chill out, be the happy you. We had an argument one day and we were driving down the road. I remember screaming at him. He was shouting back at me and I tried to jump out of the moving car. I needed to get away from him. All of this was with the babies in the back of the car. It definitely got worse after I had my children. Not to mention the strain of having three babies under the age of two put on me. Interestingly, my mum, who was one of seven children, said that she remembered her mum saying that she only felt sane when she was pregnant. PMDD is genetic, and maybe that's where I got it from. But I'm glad I stopped at three children, though. From the outside looking in, you probably thought that I was a fiery redhead who was passionate about life and what she believed in, and someone who liked to voice her opinions. I masked the effects of what was happening to me inside quite well. From the outside, you wouldn't have known what I was going through. When my children were young, I knew when it was going to start because I would scream, not at them, but behind closed doors. I would lock myself in the bathroom and scream into my hands. I would want to bang my head on the sink to take away the pain. The fatigue and depression were so bad that some days I just couldn't get out of bed. And when my children started school, I was late all the time. I would be saying hello to all of the mums as they were walking out of the playground and I was walking in to the school office with the kids. It's not because I was disorganised, but because I couldn't fathom how to get out of the house. I had three kids to organise and I would look at their little bags and uniforms and wonder what I had to do with them all. How could I get them ready, pack their bags, open the front door, 
get them to in the car and drive the three minute journey to school. My mind just didn't compute. It would completely malfunction. I would look at a pile of washing and wonder how I would manage to put a load on. Such simple tasks would be like climbing a mountain. The effects of my moods lasted for two weeks. It started when my body ovulated and for the next two weeks, the effects got worse and worse until the day that my period came. Then it was like the switch had been flicked again and hooray, it was gone. Hello me again. I would spend that week of my period recovering from the exhaustion of the past two weeks. And during the fourth week before I ovulated again, I would be full of energy. I would restart my gym routine and healthy eating. I would be so happy. I was like superwoman. The washing was all done with ease. I would see friends, make plans, have a brilliant business idea, redecorate the house. I would feel so good. And those horrendous feelings would be a million miles away. I would think, right, this month I will be fine. Look at me now. I will not fall from this. This is me and I love being me. Then I ovulated. The switch had been flipped and bang, here we go again. Month after month, year after year, this life debilitating condition controlled my body and my mind. It makes me so sad writing this. After I had my son, I decided that I wanted to be sterilized as I knew that I didn't want to have any more children. I asked my GP to refer me to a gynecologist, which they did. At my first appointment with him, after he had gone through the procedure with me, I said as a flippant comment, can you just whip my ovaries out whilst you're in there? And his reply floored me. Yes, he said, but why? I told him that I suffered from terrible PMT. He asked me a few more questions and then said, that is a thing called PMDD and yes, I can help you. That was the first time I had heard of PMDD, premenstrual dysphoric disorder. I was 38 years old. He told me to go away and track my menstrual cycle for two months, then go back and see him. In the meantime, I had my sterilization procedure and all was well with that. The first time ever a medical professional had understood what I was talking about and he said that he could help me, I left his office in floods of tears. The fact that somebody actually understood what I was saying and that I wasn't a crazy lady was just incredible. I set to work researching PMDD and I came across some fabulous information and support groups online that explained it all. I have found a community of other women who were struggling just like me. It was such a weird feeling. I felt like I'd been living a lie for all those years because I knew that deep down, I was a happy, loving, caring person. I could see now how some of the situations that I had been in, my crazy reactions to things throughout my life had been controlled by the PMDD. Exercise. The different lines of treatment for PMDD are as follows. Exercise, CBT, contraceptive pill, coil, antidepressants. HRT, a higher dose of antidepressants. GnRH analogs injection. This induces chemical menopause. Total hysterectomy with bilateral ophorectomy. Everything removed, cervix, uterus, fallopian tubes and ovaries. We're all different and different treatments work for different people. For me, over the years, I was put on so many different pills. Luckily, I would know pretty quickly what suited me and what didn't. Some would work for a while and some would send me over the edge. Exercise and diet and CBT did really help, but only to a degree. I tried the marina coil and that didn't work for me, emotionally or physically. I knew my body so well. I begged the GPs to help me. 
One doctor actually laughed at me when I said that I needed to have my ovaries removed. It was like I was fighting another losing battle. Amazingly, it took me a while to go back to the gynaecologist with my cycle chart because I needed to get my head around all of the information. I took my mum with me to the appointment because out of everyone, she knew my symptoms better than me. When I described the long list of symptoms to her, she said that it was like describing me. I didn't just have a few of the symptoms, I had every single one. At my appointment, the gynaecologist had no doubt that I needed to have my ovaries removed and a total hysterectomy. But we had to try every line of treatment just to prove that we had explored everything before doing something so drastic. He prescribed me the GnRH injection that would put me into chemical menopause. I was 39 now and I couldn't wait to get this injection inside of me. He wrote to my GP and I contacted them. They ordered the injection. When I turned up, they didn't have it. I had to have it on a certain day of my cycle and if I missed that, I would have to wait another month for it. That meant another month of hell. I'd come so far and now I couldn't have it. I spoke to the doctor's surgery and unfortunately I was in full PMDD mode and this had sent me over the edge. I told them that I was at the window in my house and I was going to jump. I was told that I'd have to call back in the morning to which I replied, I will be dead by then. I then received a letter from the doctor's surgery telling me that I was being too demanding and that they were going to refuse me the treatment I literally couldn't believe it. I had begged GPs, I had been laughed at, I had been fogged off, and it's just, that it's just being a woman and that I should just deal with it. And now I was this close and they were refusing me treatment, even though it had been re recommended by a specialist consultant. In the end, my mum had to take over speaking to the surgery. They agreed to order the injection and made, made me an appointment. I saw the head doctor instead of a nurse and before he gave me that injection, I broke down and I said that I needed to explain what I had been living with. He was genuinely shocked. He had never heard of PMDD. He actually apologised to me for letting me down. Finally, I was getting somewhere. He gave me the injection and promised that it would be there waiting for me every month that I needed it and thankfully it was. So now I have the GnRH in my system, goodbye PMDD, hello menopause. Slam dunk, straight in. It was like running into a brick wall. My bones hurt from head to toe, I had the hot sweats, I had it all. But thankfully, I was now being taken care of and with the help of the GP and my consultant, they made me feel better with oestrogen gel. The whole reason for being put into a chemically induced menopause was to see that if turning everything off stopped the symptoms of PMDD, and it did. The relief was incredible. This proved that I could be free of PMDD if I had my ovaries removed as you could only stay on the injection for a short period of time. Planned for just after my 40th birthday, I had a total hysterectomy and my ovaries removed. I was so excited to have this done, but at the same time, I had that feeling of grief again. I knew my life was gonna change forever and I was gonna to have to say goodbye to the crazy person within me. As mad as that sounds, I had lived with her for so many years and now, she would be gone. We've been through so much together. We had created ways of coping. I wanted her gone, but it would be strange without her. I had to now get used to the new me, the me that was always there, but now she had moved in full time. It obviously took a while for everything to settle down and to get the right levels of estrogen and testosterone gels. But now my life is unrecognisable to how it once was. Although I managed to hold down good jobs and friendships, etc., the struggles and battles were unreal. And now that has all gone. 
I am balanced physically and emotionally. During my diagnosis period, I spent a few years being a single mum and focusing on myself, working on my true worth and what I actually wanted out of life and out of a relationship. When I was ready, I met the most fabulous man and I no longer felt that I had to push anyone away. He has stuck by me through my treatments and we live a very happy life together. I allow him to love me and that feels amazing as it's something I've had to learn to allow. I also have made wonderful groups of friends. I've even been on a girls weekend away. This is something that I could never have done before. I can finally plan things. I have my own successful permanent makeup and aesthetics business and I now work as a mentor with ambitious women who want more out of life. I am living proof that you can get through the darkest of times and that you can achieve all the things that you desire. My real passion in life is making women feel fabulous and giving them unwavering confidence that they don't have to put up and shut up and they can reach their goals and ambitions in life, even through the tough times. It sounds really cliche, but I'm gonna say it. If just one woman who reads this can relate to what I have been through, then it will all be worth opening up like this. Please know that there is help out there and you are not alone. With love.